The Lord of the Rings Book 6 Chapter 8 The Scouring of the Shire After Nightfall The tired and wet travellers finally arrived at the Brandywine, only to find their path blocked. Spiked gates barred both ends of the bridge, and on the other side of the river, they saw new two-story houses with narrow, dimly lit windows that looked grim and out of place for the Shire. They knocked on the outer gate and called out, but received no response at first. Then, to their surprise, someone blew a horn and the lights went out. A voice called from the darkness, who's there? Go away. You can't come in. Can't you read the notice? No admittance between sundown and sunrise. Sam shouted back, of course, we can't read the notice in the dark. And if hobbits of the Shire are to be kept out on a wet night like this, I'll tear down your notice when I find it. At that, a window slammed shut, and a group of hobbits with lanterns came out from the house on the left. They opened the far gate and crossed the bridge, looking frightened when they saw the travellers. Come along. Mary called out, recognising one of the hobbits. If you don't know me, Hob Hayward, you should. I am Mary Brandebuck, and I want to know what's going on and why you, a Bucklander, are here. You used to be at the Hay Gate. Bless me. It's Master Mary, all geared up for fighting, exclaimed Old Hob. They said you were dead, lost in the old forest. I'm glad to see you alive. Then stop staring at me through the bars and open the gate. Mary demanded. I'm sorry, Master Mary, but we have orders, Hob replied. Whose orders? Mary asked. The chief's up at Bag End. Chief. Chief. Do you mean Mr. Lotho? Frodo interjected. I suppose so, Mr. Baggins, but we must just say the chief nowadays. Do you indeed, said Frodo. Well, it's high time the family dealt with him and put him in his place. A hush fell over the hobbits beyond the gate. Talking like that won't help, one said. He'll hear about it. And if you make too much noise, you'll wake the chief's big man. We'll wake him up in a surprising way, Mary responded. If your precious chief has hired ruffians from the wild, we've returned just in time. Mary dismounted, tore down the notice by lantern light, and threw it over the gate. The hobbits backed away without opening it. Come on, Pippin. Mary called. Two of us are enough. Mary and Pippin climbed the gate, causing the hobbits to flee. Another horn sounded, and a large, heavy figure appeared from the bigger house on the right, silhouetted against the doorway light. What's all this, he snarled as he approached. Gate breaking. Clear out, or I'll break your filthy necks. Then he paused, seeing the gleam of swords. Bill Fernie, said Mary, if you don't open that gate in ten seconds, you'll regret it. I'll use my sword on you if you disobey. And after you open the gates, you'll go through them and never return. You're a ruffian and a highway robber. Bill Fernie flinched, shuffled to the gate, and unlocked it. Give me the key. Mary ordered. Fernie threw the key at Mary's head and darted into the darkness. As he passed the ponies, one kicked him, and he fled with a yelp into the night, never to be seen again. Neat work, Bill, said Sam, referring to the pony. So much for your big man, said Mary. We'll deal with the chief later. For now, we need a place to stay, and since you've torn down the bridge in and built this dismal place, you'll have to put us up. I'm sorry, Mr. Mary, said Hob, but it isn't allowed. What isn't allowed? Mary asked. Taking in folk offhand like, and eating extra food, and all that, Hob replied. What's wrong with this place? Mary asked. Has it been a bad year or what? I thought it had been a good summer and harvest. The year's been good enough, said Hob. We grow a lot of food, but we don't rightly know what becomes of it. It's all these gatherers and sharers, I reckon, going around counting, measuring, and taking off to storage. 
They do more gathering than sharing, and we never see most of the stuff again. Oh come on, said Pippin yawning. This is all too tiresome for me tonight. We've got food in our bags. Just give us a room to lie down in. It'll be better than many places I have seen. The hobbits at the gate still seemed uneasy, evidently some rule was being broken, but they couldn't argue with four-armed travelers, two of whom were unusually large and strong-looking. Frodo ordered the gates locked again, recognizing the sense in keeping a guard while ruffians were about. The four companions went into the hobbit guardhouse and made themselves as comfortable as possible. It was a bare, ugly place with a mean little grate that wouldn't allow a good fire. The upper rooms had rows of hard beds, and every wall had a notice and list of rules, which Pippin tore down. There was no beer and very little food, but with what the travelers brought and shared, they made a fair meal. Pippin broke rule four by using most of the next day's wood allowance on the fire. Well now, what about a smoke, while you tell us what has been happening in the Shire, he said. There isn't any pipeweed now, said Hob, at least only for the chief's men. All the stocks seem to have gone. We hear that wagon loads of it went away down the old road out of the South Farthing, over Sarnford Way. That would be the end of last year, after you left. But it had been going away quietly before that, in a small way. That Lotho, now you shut up, Hob Hayward, cried several others. You know talk like that isn't allowed. The chief will hear of it, and we'll all be in trouble. He wouldn't hear anything if some of you weren't sneaks, rejoined Hob hotly. All right, all right, said Sam. That's quite enough. No welcome, no beer, no smoke, and a lot of rules and orc talk instead. I had hoped to get some rest, but I can see there's work and trouble ahead. Let's sleep and forget it till morning. The new chief clearly had ways of getting news quickly. Despite it being forty miles from the bridge to Bag End, someone made the journey in a hurry. Frodo and his friends soon discovered this. They hadn't made any definite plans, but had vaguely thought of going down to Crick Hollow together to rest a bit. But seeing the state of things, they decided to go straight to Hobbiton. So the next day, they set out along the road and jogged along steadily. The wind had dropped, but the sky was grey. The land looked rather sad and forlorn, but it was the first of November and the end of autumn. Still, there seemed to be an unusual amount of burning going on, with smoke rising from many points around. A great cloud of it was going up far away in the direction of the woody end. As evening fell, they were drawing near to Frogmorton, a village right on the road, about twenty-two miles from the bridge. They intended to stay the night at the floating log, a good inn in Frogmorton. But as they came to the east end of the village, they met a barrier with a large board saying, no road, behind it stood a large band of sheriffs, with stays in their hands and feathers in their caps, looking both important and rather scared. What's all this, said Frodo, feeling inclined to laugh. This is what it is, Mr. Baggins, said the leader of the sheriffs, a two-feather hobbit, you're arrested for gate-breaking, tearing up rules, assaulting gatekeepers, trespassing, and sleeping in shire buildings without leave, and bribing guards with food. And what else, said Frodo. That'll do to start with, said the sheriff leader. I can add some more if you'd like, said Sam. Calling your chief names, wishing to punch his pimply face, and thinking you sheriffs look a lot of fools. That's enough, mister. It's the chief's orders that you come along quietly. We're taking you to Bywater to hand you over to the chief's men, and when he deals with your case, you can have your say. But if you don't want to stay in the lock holes any longer than necessary, I'd keep it short. To the discomfiture of the sheriffs, Frodo and his companions all roared with laughter. Don't be absurd, said Frodo. I am going where I please, and in my own time. I happen to be going to Bag End on business, but if you insist on coming too, well that is your affair. Very well, Mr. Baggins, said the leader, pushing the barrier aside. But don't forget I've arrested you. 
I won't, said Frodo. Never. But I may forgive you. Now I am not going any further today, so if you'll kindly escort me to the floating log, I'll be obliged. I can't do that, Mr. Baggins. The inn's closed. There's a sheriff house at the far end of the village. I'll take you there. All right, said Frodo. Lead on and we'll follow. Sam had been looking the sheriffs up and down and had spotted one he knew. Hey, come here, Robin Smallborough, he called. I want a word with you. With a sheepish glance at his leader, who looked wrathful but didn't dare to interfere, Sheriff Smallborough fell back and walked beside Sam, who got down off his pony. Look here, Cock Robin, said Sam. You're hobbiton bred and ought to have more sense than to waylay Mr. Frodo and all. And what's this about the inn being closed? They're all closed, said Robin. The chief doesn't hold with beer. At least that's how it started. But now I reckon it's his men who have it all. And he doesn't hold with folk moving about. So if they will or they must, then they have to go to the sheriff house and explain their business. You ought to be ashamed of yourself having anything to do with such nonsense, said Sam. You used to like the inside of an inn better than the outside yourself. You were always popping in, on duty or off. And so I would be still, Sam, if I could. But don't be hard on me. What can I do? You know how I went for a sheriff seven years ago, before any of this began. It gave me a chance to walk around the country and see folk, hear the news, and know where the good beer was. But now it's different. But you can give it up, stop sheriffing, if it has stopped being a respectable job, said Sam. We're not allowed to, said Robin. If I hear not allowed much more, said Sam, I'm going to get angry. Can't say as I'd be sorry to see it, said Robin, lowering his voice. If we all got angry together, something might be done. But it's these men, Sam, the chief's men. He sends them everywhere, and if any of us small folk stand up for our rights, they drag him off to the lock holes. They took old flour dumpling, old will Whitfoot the mayor, first, and they've taken many more. Lately, it's been getting worse. Often they beat them now. Then why do you do their work for them? said Sam angrily. Who sent you to Frogmorton? No one did. We stay here in the big sheriff house. We're the first East Farthing troop now. There are hundreds of sheriffs in total, and they want more with all these new rules. Most of them are in it against their will, but not all. Even in the Shire, some like minding other folks' business and talking big. And there's worse than that. A few do spy work for the chief and his men. Ah? So that's how you had news of us, is it? That's right. We're not allowed to send by it now, but they use the old quick post service and keep special runners at different points. One came in from Whitfurrow's last night with a secret message, and another took it on from here. And a message came back this afternoon saying you were to be arrested and taken to Bywater, not direct to the lock holes. The chief wants to see you at once, evidently. He won't be so eager when Mr. Frodo is finished with him, said Sam, the sheriff house at Frogmorton was as bad as the bridge house. It had only one story, but it had the same narrow windows, and it was built of ugly pale bricks, badly laid. Inside, it was damp and cheerless, and supper was served on a long bare table that hadn't been scrubbed for weeks. The food deserved no better setting. The travellers were glad to leave the place. It was about 18 miles to Bywater, and they set off at 10 o'clock in the morning. They would have started earlier, but the delay so clearly annoyed the sheriff leader. The west wind had shifted northward, and it was turning colder, but the rain was gone. It was rather a comic cavalcade that left the village, though the few folk who came out to stare at the travellers get up did not seem quite sure whether laughing was allowed. A dozen sheriffs had been assigned as an escort to the prisoners, but Mary made them march in front, 
while Frodo and his friends rode behind. Merry, Pippin, and Sam sat at their ease, laughing, talking, and singing, while the sheriffs stumped along trying to look stern and important. Frodo, however, was silent and looked rather sad and thoughtful, the last person they encountered was an old man trimming a hedge. Hello, hello, he mocked. Who's arresting who now? Two of the sheriffs immediately left the group and approached him. Leader. Mary commanded. Order your men back at once, or I'll handle them myself. The two hobbits returned reluctantly at the leader's sharp command. Now move on. Mary ordered, and the travelers made sure their ponies kept a brisk pace, forcing the sheriffs to keep up. The sun came out, and despite the cold wind, the sheriffs were soon panting and sweating. At the three-farthing stone, they gave up. They had covered nearly fourteen miles with only one rest at noon. It was now three o'clock. Hungry and footsore, they could not maintain the pace. Well, come along at your own speed. Mary said. We're moving on. Goodbye, Robin. Sam called. I'll wait for you outside the Green Dragon, if you remember where that is. Don't dawdle. You're breaking a rest, the leader said ruefully, and I can't be responsible. We'll break many things yet, and not ask you to be responsible, Pippin retorted. Good luck to you. The travelers trotted on, and as the sun began to set towards the white downs on the western horizon, they arrived at Bywater by its wide pool and there they experienced their first real shock. This was Frodo and Sam's home, and they realized how much they cared about it more than anywhere else in the world. Many familiar houses were gone. Some appeared to have been burned down. The pleasant row of old hobbit holes on the north side of the pool was deserted, and their little gardens, once bright, were now overgrown with weeds. Worse, a row of ugly new houses lined poolside, where the Hobbiton Road ran close to the bank. An avenue of trees had stood there, now all gone. Looking up the road towards Bag End, they saw a tall brick chimney in the distance, belching black smoke into the evening air. Sam was beside himself. I'm going right on, Mr. Frodo, he cried. I want to see what's going on. I need to find my gaffer. We ought to find out what we're up against first. Sam, Mary cautioned. I suspect the chief has a gang of ruffians around. We should find someone who can tell us the situation here. But in Bywater, all the houses and holes were shut, and no one greeted them. They wondered about this until they reached the Green Dragon, the last house on the Hobbiton side, now lifeless with broken windows. They were disturbed to see half a dozen large, unfriendly men lounging against the inn wall. They were squint eyed and sallow face. Like Bill Furness' friend in Bree, Sam said. Like many I saw at Isengard, Mary muttered. The ruffians had clubs and horns, but no other visible weapons. As the travelers approached, the ruffians left the wall and blocked the road. Where do you think you're going? one asked, the largest and most sinister of the group. No road for you ahead. And where are those precious sheriffs? Coming along nicely, Mary replied. A bit footsore, perhaps. We promised to wait for them here. What did I say? The ruffian sneered to his companions. I told Sharky not to trust those little fools. We should have sent some of our own men. And what difference would that have made? Mary asked. We aren't used to footpads in this country but we know how to deal with them. Footpads, eh, the man replied. Change your tone, or we'll change it for you. You little folk are getting too uppity. Don't rely too much on the boss's kindness. Sharky's here now, and he'll do what Sharky says. And what may that be? Frodo asked quietly. This country needs waking up and setting right, the ruffian said. Sharky will do it, and he'll be harsh if you push him. You need a bigger boss, and you'll get one, before the year's out if there's more trouble. Then you'll learn a thing or two, 
you little rat folk. Indeed. I'm glad to hear of your plans, Frodo said. I'm on my way to call on Mr. Lotho, and he might be interested in hearing them too. The ruffian laughed. Lotho. He knows all right. Don't worry. He'll do what Sharky says. Because if a boss causes trouble, we can change him. And if little folks try to meddle, we can put them out of action. See. Yes, I see, Frodo said. For one thing, I see you're behind on the news. Much has happened since you left the South. Your day is over, and all other ruffians. The Dark Tower has fallen, and there is a king in Gonda. Isengard has been destroyed, and your master is a beggar in the wilderness. I passed him on the road. The king's messengers will ride up the greenway now, not bullies from Isengard. The man stared and smiled. A beggar in the wilderness. Oh, really? Swagger all you want, little cocky whoop. But that won't stop us from living in this fat little country where you've lazed long enough. And he snapped his fingers in Frodo's face, King's messengers. That for them. When I see one, maybe I'll take notice. This was too much for Pippin. His thoughts went back to the field of Cormallon, and here was a ruffian calling the ring-bearer, Little Cocky Whoop. He threw back his cloak, drew his sword, and the silver and sable of Gonda gleamed as he rode forward. I am a messenger of the king, he declared. You are speaking to the king's friend, one of the most renowned in all the lands of the West. You are a ruffian and a fool. Down on your knees in the road and ask pardon, or I will set this troll's bane in you. The sword glinted in the setting sun. Merry and Sam drew their swords and rode up to support Pippin, but Frodo did not move. The ruffians retreated. Scaring Breland peasants and bullying bewildered hobbits was one thing. Fearless hobbits with bright swords and grim faces were a different matter. There was a tone in the newcomers' voices they had not heard before. It chilled them with fear. Go. Mary commanded. If you trouble this village again, you'll regret it the three hobbits advanced, and then the ruffians turned and fled, running up the hobbiton road while blowing their horns. Well, we've returned just in time, Mary said. Not a moment too soon. Perhaps too late to save Lotho, said Frodo. He was a pitiful fool, but I still feel sorry for him. Save Lotho. What do you mean? Pippin asked. I'd say destroy him. I don't think you fully understand, Pippin, Frodo replied. Lotho never intended things to get this bad. He's been foolish and wicked, but he's trapped now. The ruffians are in control, looting and bullying, and they're doing whatever they want in his name. Soon, they won't even need his name. He's likely a prisoner in Bag End, scared out of his wits. We need to try and rescue him. Well, I'm shocked, said Pippin. Of all the possible endings to our journey, having to fight half-orcs and ruffians in the Shire to save Lotho Pimple is the last thing I expected. Fight? Frodo said. It might come to that. But remember, no killing hobbits, even if they've sided with the enemy. I mean truly sided, not just following orders out of fear. No hobbit has ever deliberately killed another in the Shire, and it won't start now. And avoid killing anyone if possible. Keep your tempers and hold back until the last possible moment. But if there are many of these ruffians, Mary said, we'll have to fight. You can't save Lotho or the Shire just by being shocked and sad, my dear Frodo. No, Pippin agreed. It won't be so easy scaring them again. They were taken by surprise. You heard that horn blowing. There are definitely more ruffians nearby. They'll be much bolder in a group. We should think about finding cover for the night. After all, we're only four, even if we are armed. I have an idea, said Sam. Let's go to old Tom Cotton's down South Lane. 
he's always been a stout fellow. And he has lots of lads, who are all friends of mine. No, said Mary. Hiding is exactly what people have been doing, and it's what these ruffians want. They'll just come down on us in force, corner us, and then drive us out, or burn us alive. No, we need to act immediately. Do what? asked Pippin. Raise the shire. Mary exclaimed. Now. Wake up everyone. They hate all this, you can see, all of them except perhaps one or two rascals, and a few fools who want to be important, but don't understand what's really happening. But shire folk have been so comfortable for so long they don't know what to do. They just need a spark, and they'll ignite. The chief's men know that. They'll try to stamp us out quickly. We have very little time. Sam, you can dash to Cotton's farm if you want. He's the main person around here, and the sturdiest. Come on. I'm going to blow the horn of Rohan, and give them a sound they've never heard before. They rode back to the middle of the village. Sam turned aside and galloped down the lane towards Cotton's farm. He hadn't gone far when he heard a clear horn call ring into the sky. It echoed over hill and field and it was so compelling that Sam almost turned back himself. His pony reared and neighed. On, lad. On, he cried. We'll be going back soon. Then he heard Mary change the note, and the horn cry of Buckland rang out, shaking the air. Awake. Awake. Fear, fire, foes. Awake. Fire, foes. Awake. Behind him, Sam heard a commotion of voices and the slamming of doors. In front of him, lights sprang up in the twilight, dogs barked, people came running. Before he reached the lane's end, Farmer Cotton and his three sons, Tom, Jolly, and Nick, came hurrying towards him with axes in their hands, blocking the way. No. It's not one of those ruffians, Sam heard the farmer say. It's a hobbit by the size of him, but dressed oddly. Hey, he called. Who are you, and what's all this commotion? It's Sam, Sam Gamgee. I've come back. Farmer Cotton came closer and stared at him in the twilight. Well, he exclaimed. The voice is right, and your face is no worse than it was, Sam. But I'd have passed you on the street in that gear. You've been in foreign parts, it seems. We feared you were dead. I'm not, said Sam. Nor is Mr. Frodo. He's here with his friends. And that's the commotion. They are raising the shire. We're going to drive out these ruffians and their chief too. We're starting now. Good, good, cried Farmer Cotton. So it's finally begun. I've been itching for trouble all year, but folks wouldn't help. And I've had the wife and Rosie to think of. These ruffians don't stop at anything. But come on now, lads. By water is up. We must join in. What about Mrs. Cotton and Rosie? Sam asked. It's not safe for them to be left alone. My nibs is with them. But you can go and help him, if you want said Farmer Cotton with a grin. Then he and his sons ran off towards the village. Sam hurried to the house. By the large round door at the top of the steps from the wide yard stood Mrs. Cotton and Rosie, with Nibs in front of them grasping a hayfork. It's me, shouted Sam as he trotted up. Sam Gamgee. So don't try prodding me, Nibs. Anyway, I'm wearing a mail shirt. He jumped down from his pony and went up the steps. They stared at him in silence. Good evening, Mrs. Cotton, he said. Hello, Rosie. Hello, Sam, said Rosie. Where have you been? They said you were dead, but I've been expecting you since the spring. You haven't hurried, have you? Perhaps not, said Sam, abashed. But I'm hurrying now. We're dealing with the ruffians, and I have to get back to Mr. Frodo. 
but I thought I'd check on you and Mrs. Cotton, Rosie. We're doing fine, thank you, said Mrs. Cotton. Or we would be, if it weren't for these thieving ruffians. Well, be off with you, said Rosie. If you've been looking after Mr. Frodo all this time, why leave him now that things are getting dangerous? This was too much for Sam. It needed a week's answer, or none. He turned away and mounted his pony. But as he started off, Rosie ran down the steps. I think you look fine, Sam, she said. Go now. But be careful, and come straight back once you've dealt with the ruffians. When Sam returned, he found the entire village mobilized. Over a hundred sturdy hobbits, armed with axes, heavy hammers, long knives, stout staves, and some even with hunting boughs, were already assembled. More were still arriving from surrounding farms. Some villagers had lit a large fire to boost morale, and because it was something the chief had forbidden. It blazed brightly as night fell. Others, following Mary's orders, were setting up barricades at each end of the village. When the sheriffs arrived at the lower barricade, they were stunned. However, most of them, seeing the situation, discarded their feathers and joined the rebellion, while the rest sneaked away. Sam found Frodo and his friends by the fire talking to old Tom Cotton, surrounded by an admiring crowd of Bywater folk. What's the next step? asked Farmer Cotton. I can't say, replied Frodo, until I know more. How many of these ruffians are there? It's hard to say, said Cotton. They move around a lot. Sometimes there are fifty of them in their hideouts up near Hobbiton, but they often roam around, thieving or gathering as they call it. There's usually at least twenty around the boss, as they call him. He's at Bag End, or was, but he doesn't leave the grounds anymore. No one's seen him for a week or two, and the men don't let anyone near. Hobbiton isn't their only base, is it? Pippin asked, unfortunately not, said Cotton. There are quite a few down south in Longbottom and by San Ford, and more hiding in the woody end. They also have hideouts at Waymeet. And then there are the lockholes, old storage tunnels in Michel Delving that they've turned into prisons for those who oppose them. I reckon there are no more than three hundred of them in the Shire, maybe fewer. We can handle them if we stick together, do they have any weapons? Mary asked, whips, knives, and clubs, enough for their dirty work, that's all they've shown so far, said Cotton. But they probably have more if it comes to a fight. Some have bows too. They've already shot one or two of our people, there you go, Frodo, said Mary. I knew we'd have to fight. Well, they started the killing, not exactly, said Cotton. At least not the shooting. The took started that. Your dad, Mr. Pegrin, never supported Lotho from the beginning, he said that if anyone was to be in charge, it should be the rightful Tyne of the Shire, not some upstart. When Lotho sent his men, they got nothing from him. The Tooks are lucky, they have those deep holes in the green hills, the great smiles and all, where the ruffians can't reach them. They won't let the ruffians onto their land, and if they do, the Tooks hunt them down. They shot three for prowling and robbing. After that, the ruffians turned even nastier and keep a close watch on Tookland. No one gets in or out now, good for the Tooks, cried Pippin. But someone needs to get in again now. I'm heading to the Smiles. Who's coming with me to Tuckborough? Pippin rode off with a few lads on ponies. See you soon, he shouted. It's only about fourteen miles over the fields. I'll bring back an army of Tooks by morning, Mary blew the horn as they rode off into the darkening night. The people cheered, still, Frodo said to those nearby, I want no killing, not even of the ruffians, unless absolutely necessary to protect hobbits, all right. Mary agreed. But I think we'll be seeing the Hobbiton gang soon. They won't come just to talk things over. We'll try to handle them carefully, but we must be ready for the worst. I have a plan, very good, said Frodo. 
You make the arrangements. Just then, some hobbits who had been sent towards Hobbiton came running back. They are coming, they reported. About twenty or more. But two have gone off west across the country, to weigh meat, to fetch more of the gang, said Cotton. Well, it's fifteen miles each way. We needn't worry about them just yet. Mary hurried off to give orders. Farmer Cotton cleared the street, sending everyone indoors except the older hobbits with weapons. They didn't have to wait long. Soon, they heard loud voices and the thudding of heavy footsteps, dot a group of ruffians marched down the road. They saw the barricade and laughed, not believing that anyone in this small village could stand up to them. The hobbits opened the barricade and stepped aside, thank you, the ruffians jeered. Now run home before you get whipped. They continued down the street shouting, put those lights out. Get inside and stay there, or we'll take fifty of you to the lock holes for a year. Get in. The boss is losing his temper, no one paid any attention to their orders, but as the ruffians passed, the hobbits quietly closed in behind and followed them. When the ruffians reached the fire, they found Farmer Cotton standing alone, warming his hands. Who are you, and what do you think you're doing? The ruffian leader demanded. Farmer Cotton looked at him slowly. I was just about to ask you that, he said. This isn't your land, and you're not wanted here. Well, you're wanted, said the leader. We want you. Get him, lads. Lock holes for him, and give him something to keep him quiet. The men took a step forward, but stopped short as a roar of voices surrounded them. They realized suddenly that Farmer Cotton was not alone. They were surrounded by nearly two hundred hobbits, all armed. Mary stepped forward, we've met before, he said to the leader, and I warned you not to come back. I warn you again, you're standing in the light and you're covered by archers. If you touch this farmer or anyone else, you'll be shot immediately. Drop any weapons you have. The leader looked around, realizing he was trapped. Though he was not afraid, backed by his fellows, he knew too little about hobbits to understand his peril. Foolishly, he decided to fight. At them, lads, he shouted. Give it to them. With a long knife in one hand and a club in the other, he charged at the ring of hobbits, trying to break through towards Hobbiton. He aimed a fierce blow at Mary, who stood in his way. He fell dead with four arrows in him. That was enough for the others. They surrendered, had their weapons taken away, and were tied up and locked in an empty hut they had built. The dead leader was dragged away and buried, it seems almost too easy, said Cotton. I said we could handle them, but we needed a signal. You came back just in time, Mr. Mary, there's still more to be done, said Mary. If your estimate is correct, we've only dealt with a fraction of them so far. But it's dark now, so I think we should hold off until morning for the next move. Then we need to contact the chief. Why not now? Sam asked. It's not even six o'clock yet, and I want to check on my father. Do you know what's happened to him, Mr. Cotton? He's not too well, but he's not too bad either, Sam, the farmer replied. They dug up Bagshot Row, which was a real blow to him. He's in one of those new houses built by the chief's men, when they were still doing some legitimate work, not far from Bywater. He comes to see me when he can, and I've made sure he's getting better food than some of the others. Of course, it's against the rules. I'd have had him stay with me, but that wasn't allowed. Thank you very much, Mr. Cotton. I won't forget it, Sam said. But I really need to see him. That boss and Sharky might cause trouble before morning. All right, Sam, Cotton said. Pick a lad or two, and go fetch him to my house. You won't need to go near the old Hobbiton village across the water. My lad Jolly will guide you. Sam left to find his father. Meanwhile, Mary organized lookouts and guards for the night. Then he and Frodo went with Farmer Cotton. 
They sat in the warm kitchen with the Cotton family, who asked polite questions about their travels, but were mainly focused on the situation in the Shire. It all started with Pimple, as we call him, Farmer Cotton said. It began just after you left, Mr. Frodo. Pimple had some strange ideas. He wanted to own everything and boss everyone around. It soon became clear he already owned more than was good for him and was always grabbing more, though where he got the money was a mystery. He had mills, malt houses, inns, farms, and leaf plantations. He had even bought Sanderman's mill before coming to Bag End. He started with a lot of property from his father in the South Farthing, and he had been selling off the best leaf quietly for a year or two. But towards the end of last year, he started sending away loads of stuff, not just leaf. Supplies began to run low, and with winter coming, people got angry. He answered by bringing in a lot of men, mostly ruffians, with wagons to carry the goods south and others to stay. Before we knew it, they were scattered all over the Shire, cutting down trees, digging, and building whatever they wanted. Initially, Pimple paid for the damages, but soon they began taking what they wanted without payment. Old Will the Mayor tried to protest at Bag End, but never made it. The ruffians captured him and locked him up in a hole in Michel Delving, and he's still there. After the new year, Pimple declared himself chief sheriff, or just chief, and did whatever he pleased. Anyone who resisted was treated like Will. Things went from bad to worse. There was no smoke left except from the men, and the chief didn't allow beer except for his men and closed all the inns. Rules got shorter and shorter, and anything you could hide from the ruffians, when they came around, gathering for fair distribution, which meant they took everything and left us with scraps, if we could stand them. Since Sharky arrived, it's been pure devastation. Who is Sharky? Mary asked. I heard one of the ruffians mention him. Seems he's the worst of the lot, Cotton answered. We first heard of him around the last harvest, maybe late September. We've never seen him, but he's up at Bag End and is now the real chief. All the ruffians follow his orders, which mostly involve hacking, burning, and ruining things, and now it's even come to killing. They cut down trees and let them lie, burn houses, and don't build new ones. Take Sanderman's mill, for instance. Pimple demolished it almost as soon as he arrived at Bag End. Then he brought in a lot of dirty-looking men to build a bigger mill with all sorts of new equipment. Only that fool Ted was happy about it and now works their cleaning wheels, where his father used to be the miller and his own boss. Pimple claimed he wanted to grind more and faster, but the new mill had no more grain than the old one. Since Sharky came, they don't grind any corn at all. They're always hammering and emitting smoke and stink, and there's no peace even at night in Hobbiton. They deliberately dump filth, polluting the lower water, and it's making its way into the Brandywine. If they want to turn the Shire into a desert, they're on the right track. I don't believe Pimple is behind all this. It's Sharky, I say. That's right. Young Tom chimed in. They even took Pimple's old mother, Lobelia, whom he cared for if no one else did. Some of the Hobbiton folks saw it. She was coming down the lane with her old umbrella when some ruffians, with a big cart, were going up. Where are you going? She asked. To Bag End, they said. What for? She asked. To put up some sheds for Sharky, they replied. Who gave you permission? She asked. Sharky, they said. So get out of the way, old hag. I'll give you Sharky, you dirty thieving ruffians. She shouted, raising her umbrella and going for the leader, who was nearly twice her size. So they took her and dragged her off to the lock holes, even at her age. They've taken others we miss more, but there's no denying she showed more spirit than most. At that moment, Sam burst in with his father. Old Gamgee didn't look much older, but was a bit deafer. Good evening, Mr. Baggins, he said. 
I'm really glad to see you back safe. But I've got a bit of a bone to pick with you, if I may. You shouldn't have sold Bag End, as I always said. That's what started all this trouble. While you've been wandering around, chasing black men up mountains, what for? Sam doesn't make clear. They've dug up Bagshot Row and ruined my potatoes. I'm very sorry, Mr. Gamgee, Frodo replied. But now that I'm back, I'll do my best to make things right. Well, you can't say fairer than that, said the gaffer. Mr. Frodo Baggins is a real gentle hobbit. I've always said, whatever you think of some others with the same name, with all due respect. And I hope Sam has behaved well and given satisfaction. Perfect satisfaction, Mr. Gamgee, Frodo said. Indeed, if you can believe it, he's now one of the most famous people in all the lands, and songs are being made about his deeds from here to the sea and beyond the Great River. Sam blushed, but looked gratefully at Frodo, while Rose's eyes shone as she smiled at him. The gaffer found it hard to believe, though he noticed that his son had been involved with unusual company. Whatever happened to his vest, he wondered. I don't agree with wearing metal armor, no matter how durable it is. The next morning, Farmer Cotton and all his guests were up early. Although nothing had happened during the night, more trouble was expected before the day was over. It seems that none of the ruffians are left at Bag End, Cotton said. But the gang from Waymeet will likely arrive soon. After breakfast, a messenger from Tookland arrived, in high spirits. The tide has rallied everyone in our region, he announced. News is spreading fast. The ruffians who were watching our land have fled south, those who managed to escape. The Tyne is pursuing them to confront the large gang down there, but he sent Mr. Pegrin back with everyone he could spare, the next update wasn't as positive. Mary, who had been out all night, arrived around ten o'clock. There's a large group about four miles away, he reported. They are coming up the road from Waymeet, but many stray ruffians have joined them. There must be close to a hundred of them, and they are setting fires as they advance. Curse them. Ah? These fellows won't stop to talk. They'll kill if they can, said Farmer Cotton. If the Tooks don't arrive soon, we'd better find cover and start shooting without delay. There's bound to be some fighting before this is over, Mr. Frodo. The Tooks did arrive sooner than expected. They marched in, a hundred strong, from Tuckborough and the Green Hills, with Pippin leading them. With their sturdy hobbits, Merry now had enough strength to confront the ruffians. Scouts reported that the ruffians were moving in tight groups, aware that the countryside had risen against them and planning to deal with the rebellion harshly at Bywater. Despite their grim demeanor, the ruffians seemed to lack any real military leadership and came on without proper precautions, Merry quickly devised a plan. The ruffians, advancing along the east road and then turning onto the Bywater road, encountered a strong barrier made of upturned old farm carts about a furlong from the main road. This halted their progress. At the same time, the hobbits revealed themselves, lining the hedges above the ruffians' heads. More hobbits then pushed out additional wagons from a hidden field, blocking the way back. A voice from above announced, Well, you've walked into a trap. Your comrades from Hobbiton did the same, and one is dead while the others are prisoners. Drop your weapons. Then step back twenty paces and sit down. Anyone who tries to escape will be shot. The ruffians, however, were not easily intimidated. Some complied, but were immediately attacked by their fellows. About twenty broke through and charged the wagons. Six were shot, but the rest broke out killing two hobbits and scattering in the direction of Woody End. Two more fell as they fled. Mary blew a loud horn, and there were answering calls from a distance. They won't get far, said Pippin. Our hunters are out in force in that area now. The trapped ruffians in the lane, about eighty in total, attempted to climb over the barrier and banks, forcing the hobbits to either shoot or hack at them with axes. 
Many of the strongest and most desperate got through on the west side and fiercely attacked their enemies, now more focused on killing than escaping. Several hobbits fell, and the remaining hobbits wavered until Merry and Pippin, who were on the east side, came to their aid. Merry himself killed the leader, a huge, squint-eyed brute resembling an orc. He then withdrew his forces, encircling the remaining ruffians with a wide ring of archers. In the end, nearly seventy ruffians were dead, and a dozen were captured. Nineteen hobbits were killed, and around thirty were wounded, the dead ruffians were loaded onto wagons and taken to a nearby old sandpit for burial, later known as the Battle Pit. The fallen hobbits were buried together on a hillside, where a large stone was later erected with a garden around it. Thus ended the Battle of Bywater in 1419, the last battle fought in the Shire, and the only battle since the Greenfields of 1147 in the North Farthing. Despite its toll, which was relatively low, it earned a special chapter in the Red Book, and the names of all who participated were recorded in a roll, memoized by Shire historians. The Cotton's rise in fame and fortune began with this event, but at the top of the roll are the names of Captains Meriadoc and Pegrin. Though Frodo had participated in the battle, he had not fought, and his main role was to prevent the hobbits, enraged by their losses, from killing those enemies who surrendered. When the fighting ended and the aftermath was organized, Merry, Pippin, and Sam joined Frodo, and they rode back with the Cottons. They had a late midday meal, and then Frodo said with a sigh, Well, I suppose it's time we dealt with the chief. Yes, indeed, the sooner, the better, said Merry. And don't be too gentle. He's responsible for bringing these ruffians in and for all the harm they've done. Farmer Cotton assembled a group of about twenty sturdy hobbits. It's only a guess that there are no ruffians left at Bag End, he said. We don't know. Then they set out on foot. Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin led the way. It was one of the saddest times of their lives. As they approached the old village across the water, they saw the new mill in all its grim and dirty ugliness. A massive brick building straddling the stream, which it polluted with a stinking, steaming outflow. Along the Bywater Road, every tree had been felled. As they crossed the bridge and looked up the hill, they were stunned. The old grange on the west side had been demolished and replaced by rows of tarred sheds. All the chestnuts were gone. The banks and hedgerows were in ruins. Great wagons were strewn in a field stripped of grass. Bagshot Row had become a gaping sand and gravel quarry. Bag End was obscured by a tangle of large huts. They've destroyed it, cried Sam. They've cut down the party tree. He pointed to where the tree that Bilbo had made his farewell speech under used to stand. It lay lopped and dead in the field. As this final blow overwhelmed him, Sam burst into tears. His sobs were interrupted by a mocking laugh. A surly hobbit lounged over the low wall of the millyard, grimer-faced and black-handed. Don't you like it, Sam, he sneered. You've always been soft. I thought you'd left on one of those ships you used to talk about, sailing away. What are you doing back here? We have work to do in the Shire now. Yes, I see, Sam replied. There's no time to wash up, but there's time to prop up walls. But listen here, Mr. Sanderman, I have a score to settle in this village, and if you keep up your mocking, you'll end up with a bill that's too big for you to pay. Ted Sanderman spat over the wall and sneered, go on. You can't touch me. I'm a friend of the boss. But if you keep running your mouth, he'll deal with you. Don't waste any more time with this fool, Sam. Frodo interrupted. I hope there aren't many more hobbits like him. That would be worse than all the damage done by the men. You're dirty and insolent, Sanderman, Mary said. And you're out of your depth. We're here to deal with your precious boss. We've already handled his men. Ted Sanderman's eyes widened as he saw the escort marching over the bridge, following Mary's signal. He dashed back into the mill, grabbed a horn, and blew it loudly. Save your breath. 
Mary laughed. I have a better one. He lifted his own silver horn and sounded it, its clear call echoing over the hill. Hobbits poured out of Hobbiton, responding to the call with cheers and following the group up the road to Bag End. When they reached the top of the lane, the party stopped, and Frodo and his friends continued on to the once-loved home. The garden was now filled with huts and sheds, some blocking the old westward windows. There were piles of refuse everywhere. The door was scarred, the bell chain was loose, and the bell wouldn't ring. Knocking brought no answer, so they pushed open the door and entered. The place was filthy and disordered, smelling strongly and clearly unused for some time. Where's that miserable Lotho hiding? Mary asked. They searched every room and found only rats and mice. Should we get the others to search the sheds? This is worse than Morda. Sam said. In some ways, it's even worse because it feels personal. It's home, and you remember how it used to be before it was ruined. Yes, this is Morda, Frodo agreed. Just one of its effects. Saruman was doing its bidding all along, even when he thought he was serving his own interests. And the same goes for those Saruman deceived, like Lotho. Merry looked around in dismay and disgust. Let's get out of here, he said. If I had known the extent of the damage he caused, I would have stuffed my pouch down Saruman's throat. No doubt, no doubt. Frodo replied. But you didn't, so I'm able to welcome you home. Standing at the door was Saruman himself, looking well-fed and pleased, his eyes gleaming with malice and amusement. Frodo suddenly realized, Sharky. Saruman laughed. So you know that name. My people in Isengard used to call me that. It was probably meant as a sign of affection. But you clearly didn't expect to see me here. I didn't, Frodo said. But I might have guessed. Gandalf warned me you were still capable of mischief. Quite capable, Saruman said, and more than a little. It amused me to see you hobbits, riding with all those important people, feeling so secure and pleased with yourselves. You thought you could come back to a peaceful life while Saruman's home was destroyed. You thought Gandalf would handle everything for you. Well, I decided to get ahead of you and teach you a lesson. One wrong turn deserves another. It would have been a harsher lesson if you had given me more time and more men. But I've already done enough damage to make your lives difficult. It will be satisfying to think about that and balance it against my grievances. Well, if that's what brings you pleasure, Frodo said, I pity you. It will only be a pleasure of memory. Now go and never return. The villagers, having seen Saruman come out of one of the huts, crowded around Bag End's door. Hearing Frodo's command, they murmured angrily, don't let him go. Kill him. He's a villain and a murderer. Kill him. Saruman looked at the angry faces and smirked. Kill me, he mocked. If you think you have enough courage, my brave hobbits. But don't think that losing all my possessions means I've lost all my power. Whoever strikes me will be cursed. If my blood stains the Shire, it will wither and never heal. The hobbits recoiled, but Frodo said, don't believe him. He has lost all power except his ability to frighten and deceive you, if you let him. But I won't have him killed. Revenge won't heal anything. Let him go, Saruman, by the quickest route. Worm. Worm. Saruman called, and Worm Tongue came crawling out of a nearby hut, almost like a dog. Back to the road, Worm. Saruman ordered. These fine fellows and lordlings are turning us loose again. Come on. Saruman started to leave, with Worm Tongue shuffling after him. But as Saruman passed close to Frodo, a knife flashed in his hand and he struck swiftly. The blade hit the hidden mail coat and snapped. A dozen hobbits, led by Sam, rushed forward with a cry and threw Saruman to the ground. Sam drew his sword. 
No, Sam. Frodo said. Don't kill him even now. He hasn't harmed me directly. And I don't want him killed in his current state of evil. He was once great and noble, and we shouldn't raise our hands against him. He has fallen, and his healing is beyond us. But I still wish to spare him, hoping he might find redemption. Saruman rose to his feet and stared at Frodo with a mix of wonder, respect, and hatred in his eyes. You've grown, halfling, he said. Yes, you've grown a lot. You're wise and cruel. You've robbed my revenge of its sweetness, and now I must leave bitter and in debt to your mercy. I hate it in you. Well, I'm going, and I'll trouble you no more. But don't expect me to wish you health and a long life. You'll have neither. But that's not my doing. I'm merely foretelling he walked away, and the hobbits parted to let him through, though their grips tightened on their weapons. Wormtongue hesitated but eventually followed his master, Wormtongue. Frodo called out. You don't have to follow him. I don't know of any harm you've done to me. You can stay here for a while, get some rest and food, and leave when you're ready. Wormtongue paused and looked back, as if considering staying. Saruman turned around and sneered, no harm. Oh no, Wormtongue only sneaks out at night to look at the stars. But did I hear someone asking where poor Lotho is hiding? You know, don't you, Worm? Will you tell them? Wormtongue cringed and whimpered, no, no. Then I will, Saruman declared. Worm killed your chief, your dear little boss. Didn't you, Worm? Stabbed him in his sleep, I believe. I hope you buried him, although Wormtongue has been quite hungry lately. No, Worm is not truly nice. You should leave him to me. A look of fierce hatred flashed in Wormtongue's eyes. You told me to do it, you made me do it, he hissed, Saruman laughed. You always do what Sharky says, don't you, Worm? Well, Sharky says, follow. He kicked Wormtongue in the face as he groveled and then turned to leave, but something snapped in Wormtongue. He suddenly sprang up, drawing a hidden knife. With a snarl like a dog, he attacked Saruman from behind, slashing his throat before running down the lane with a yell, before Frodo could react or say anything, three hobbits fired their bows, and Wormtongue fell dead. To the shock of those present, a grey mist began to form around Saruman's body. It rose like smoke from a fire and took on the shape of a pale, shrouded figure, looming over the hill. For a moment, it wavered, looking westward. But a cold wind from the west blew it away, and with a sigh, it vanished into nothingness. Frodo looked at the body with a mix of pity and horror. It seemed as if years of death were suddenly visible, causing it to shrink and reveal a grotesque skull beneath the decayed skin. He covered the body with the dirty cloak lying nearby and turned away, and that's the end of that, Sam said. A nasty end, and I wish I hadn't had to see it, but it's good riddance. And hopefully the very last chapter of the war, Mary added, I hope so, Frodo sighed. The final blow. But to think it should end here, right at the door of Bag End. Among all my hopes and fears, I never expected this. I won't call it the end until we've cleaned up the mess, Sam said gloomily. And that's going to take a lot of time and effort.